What are the general properties of a file? How does a web application know you're trying to upload a script and not an image? How is it possible for a single file to be valid for multiple different types simultaneously? In this video, we are going to explore how data blobs are classified as files and some common capture the flag and penetration testing tricks related to this classification process. But before we do, the purpose of these videos is to explain theory for a specific security topic. Once you understand the theory, you'll be able to solve relevant capture the flag problems. One of the places you can solve these problems is 247ctf.com. At the end of this video, a 247ctf challenge will be referenced, which will enable you to test your practical understanding of this topic. When presented with an unknown data blob, what process is followed for an application to determine that file's type? Well, depending on the approach and implementation, there are quite a few ways this decision can be made. Typically, this decision is based on some subset of the following. Extension, media type, structure, or magic bytes. Let's start off with the easiest one in our list, the extension. When you download a .zip file, based on that extension, you would typically expect the file you just downloaded to be a zip archive, which you could then extract and further process using some unzip utility. But there are no rules governing this extension naming convention. You can simply rename the file to have almost any extension you like, including multiple extensions or even nothing. A file with no extension property is still a file. Okay, so what about media types? When you send or receive a file from a web server, the request can utilize a content type header to specify the type of file in the request. So, for example, if you are sending or receiving JSON, the content type header would specify the application slash JSON MIME type. But again, there are no rules here. The request and response messages can simply specify any content type they like. The content type doesn't actually need to be related to the real underlying file type at all. Depending on the expected file type, a more comprehensive approach is to verify the file's underlying structure. A number of files have a formal underlying structure which governs how that file is constructed. Take a PNG image for example. As we can see on Wikipedia, a PNG has a specific format. In its most simple form, there is a signature followed by a header, the actual pixel data, and finally an end terminator. Irrespective of the extension and media type, if this file structure is invalid or incorrect according to the specification, the file won't be able to be interpreted or displayed as a valid PNG file. Lastly, we have the magic bytes or signature. If a file starts with specific leading bytes representing a known type, that file will be inherently interpreted as that type. These magic bytes are well known and documented. If we look at Wikipedia again, we can see the magic bytes listed for a number of files and what those underlying bytes represent. If a file starts with these bytes, a utility which is determining the file's type based on the magic bytes will assume the file matches that type. So, for example, a file starting with the PNG magic bytes will be assumed to be a PNG image, even if the underlying file content doesn't represent a proper PNG image at all. So how is this file type decision-making process useful for an attacker? Let's take a look at an example of how an attacker could abuse each decision type starting with a file extension. What if you are faced with a file upload form on a server which you know is serving PHP scripts? To obtain the holy grail of remote code execution on that server, you would want to upload a PHP file which could then be later interpreted and interacted with. But when you try to upload a .php file, the server returns an error as that file extension is on an explicit block list. Well, what if the application is incorrectly checking that extension? For example, an interestingly designed application could be checking the extension based on the first period's location in the uploaded file name. If we upload a file with a double extension such as .png.php, we would be able to bypass this example of an insecure check. Or, depending on the configuration of the server and implementation of the upload form, we could also approach this from the other direction. So for example, uploading a reverse double extension of .php, .png could end up achieving the same result. So what about the media type? When receiving an uploaded file, the remote server may inherently trust what the client has specified as the file's content type. For example, the application could be checking the content type to verify that an image has been uploaded. If the content type header specifies an image, the file is accepted. But if the content type specifies a script, the file is not accepted. An attacker would be able to abuse this implementation by specifying a permitted image MIME type in the content type header during the upload process. 
but actually providing a PHP file as the underlying file's content. The application server would accept the file based on the permitted content type, thereby allowing an attacker to upload a PHP script, again bypassing this insecure check. Remote code execution strikes again. Rather than just a file upload, the end application may be performing some data processing based on the user provided file type. For example, an application may be assuming that a user sending data with an application slash JSON MIME type is sending JSON data. What the application developer may not have expected is that the library they are using for data processing is very user friendly. If a user submits XML data with an application slash XML MIME type, the library may attempt to interpret and then process that XML data as well. Depending on the underlying XML parser configuration, a malicious user could abuse this unexpected data processing use case to perform an XML external entity attack via what the developer presumed to be a JSON parsing endpoint. And what about the file's underlying structure? In order to verify a file structure, the application must somehow be able to parse it. For instance, with an image, the parsing would likely be performed by some image library. Like any application, these underlying image libraries themselves can be vulnerable to attacks. For example, the image tragic vulnerability directly exploited the image magic image processing library during the image parsing and conversion process. In order to obtain remote code execution on a vulnerable remote server, all you would need to do is upload a specially crafted image file which abuses the vulnerable image magic delegate function. Alternatively, an attacker could make use of a polyglot file. A polyglot file is a file which has a valid structure across at least two different file formats, though it can be more. For example, it's possible to create a file that has a valid structure for both a FAR package and a JPEG image. This can be useful when an image upload form permits strict uploading of a valid JPEG structure only, and you are looking to finalize a supplementary exploit, such as abusing an unserialized vulnerability. What you could do is, Upload a valid JPEG image via the application, then utilize the file structure within that valid image file to finalize your exploit for some more remote code execution. In addition to assisting with unserialized type attacks, polygots can also be useful when exploiting other vulnerability classes, such as local file inclusions. If you have identified a local file inclusion vulnerability, but you can only upload structurally correct and XF data stripped PNG files, what could you do? Well, you could still create a file which has a valid PNG structure, but also includes an embedded PHP shell stored within the IDAT chunks. You can still upload the file as a valid PNG as the structure is still correct, but you can also now abuse the local file inclusion to include your malicious PHP data hidden within the PNG file. Remote code execution is back. Lastly, what about those magic bytes? A file you have access to may be corrupted or otherwise unrecognizable. If you look at the file in a hex editor, or look for any hints or ideas in the extension, media type, or underlying structure, you may be able to make an informed guess as to what the underlying file actually represents, even when your tools are rightfully confused. For example, if you see information about IDAT chunks and an IN footer, you could probably assume that the underlying file represents a PNG image. In order to restore such a corrupted file, you could simply replace the leading corrupted file bytes with the known correct magic byte data to recover the underlying file. Alternatively, this known leading signature can be used as part of a cryptographic known plain text attack. If you have an encrypted file of a known type and depending on the specific encryption performed, you could start to recover and decrypt the encrypted data by manipulating the known magic bytes to recover the plain text. A repeated XOR cipher with a manageable key size is a good example of this. If you know a file is a PNG image, you can make use of the known file signature and the commutative properties of XOR to recover the key and then the file. In this specific case, all you need to do is XOR the encrypted file with the known PNG magic bytes to recover the key, then XOR the encrypted file with this recovered key to decrypt and recover the image. At the 247 CTF, you can practice this theory yourself. The challenge, My Magic Bytes in the Cryptography category, will reward you with a flag if you can recover a corrupted image using known Magic Bytes. If you have any thoughts on this topic or requests for future videos in this Capture the Flag fundamental series, be sure to let us know in the comments section below.